Uh, thanks to Professor Kevin Cruz for joining us this morning. Uh, MBA class of 1990, now uh, uh, teaches US history at Princeton and uh, has written on uh, school desegregation in Atlanta, uh, the impact of evangelical religion on modern American politics, uh, and most recently, fault lines uh, on US political history and social history since the 1970s, and also was a contributor to the 1619 project. Uh, and then we have, uh, from MBA here, we have uh, Emmanuel Barrett, who is the president of our Tearing Down the Walls Club, which has organized several programs through the year. Uh, we have Ashton Terrell, who is the president of the African American Studies uh, Club, uh, who has been part of many of those programs and has also organized uh, several things through the year. Uh, and then Sam Meacham, who is the captain of our uh, debate team, who has taken part on many of these panels and has, I think, pretty much taken every history class that MBA uh, has to offer. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to the three of them to uh, ask some questions and then uh, hear the conversation as it unfolds. Beautiful. Thank you, Dr. Boyd, for that introduction. I'll go ahead and get us started off. So, Mr. Cruz, how did you become involved in the 1619 Project? And what do you think of its impact on conversations about how history is taught? How did I become involved? As a historian, I should remember this. Uh, I, I think there was a, a call out from the editors there. It was probably um, uh, Eileen and Jake Silverstein. Um, who reached out and they had a, remember it was a big conference call in the, well, no, so there's a big meeting at the New York Times in early, no, late 2018, probably. Um, yeah, uh, and, uh, and I remember it because it was the first, it sounds odd in the era of Zoom, it was the first big conference call I zoomed into, or I guess it was probably Skype at that time. And I remember thinking this is weird how a lot of us were on the screen and not in person, but now that's the norm. Uh, anyway, so they had a brainstorming session there uh, and a whole bunch of historians were involved as well as journalists. And they kind of picked our minds. And then um, one of the things I threw out, uh, what became my piece was something I talked about in my book, White Flight, which covers um, white resistance to residential, educational, and business desegregation in Atlanta. And the highway um, uh, issue was one thing I talked about uh, briefly at the end, but it seemed like a, like a good connective point uh, to make. So I pitched that and they came back to me and said, yeah, we'd like you to write that. And, uh, and the rest is, uh, is history. I guess I'll go next. Professor Cruz, uh, why would you say you think many people even today, given so much consciousness raising about racial issues, are still so resistant to confronting those painful and complicated historical issues like slavery, segregation, racism, and even the ongoing systems of discrimination that exist today? It's a great question. Uh, I think there's a real wrestling with that larger national history necessarily involves wrestling with some preconceptions that many people have about themselves and their families, right? And so to recognize the way in which there have been structural inequalities is not just to say that clearly African-Americans and other racial minorities have been discriminated against, it's also to acknowledge that many white people got an unfair leg up, right? Which you can acknowledge that and recognize that and not say as a white person, therefore I had everything handed to me, but you can note that my grandfather owned land in a way in which the country made it impossible for someone else's grandfather to own land. And that wealth was handed down in my family, right? Or my grandfather was able to take advantage of a GI bill loan to get a college education or start a business or to get a house. And the way in which that system was set up precluded many African-Americans, veterans who've been honorably discharged from taking advantage of those exact same programs, right? So I think a lot of people have a real ease in saying that that's racism over there, right? At a tremendous arm's length, someone else was racist to someone else. What the hard part is, is for them to acknowledge through no fault of their own, right? It wasn't that you know, these were Klansmen out there securing GI benefits for themselves. There were many, in fact, maybe racially liberal people who got these benefits, but they didn't go to other people. And to acknowledge that you got an unfair leg up feels, I think, aligned too far. 
right? Many, and, and, and many people can point to the hard work that they and their family did, but they started a business with this and that. They worked hard, they went to college, you know, on and on. Um, and they feel that that hard work is suddenly all erased by acknowledging that they got a little bit of, of a benefit here, right? Um, my friend Matt Lassiter teaches at Michigan and um, told me one time when he gave a lecture on a great book by the Columbia political scientist, uh, Ira Katz-Nelson. And Ira's done a couple of great books. He had a great book called Fear It Itself, all about the, the racial um, nature and the, the New Deal. He had a smaller, slimmer volume, which is really effective to teach with. And the title is Why, When Affirmative Action Was White, right? And it talks about these things in the GI Bill and on and on about how there was an unfair advantage uh, uh, given to white people. Matt simply read the title in a, in a lecture one day and three guys in the front row got up and stormed out. They couldn't, couldn't hear the title of this book, right? It was that, we would use the term triggering now. It set them off that much. And I think it's because it speaks to the fact that many white people have grown up believing that they are normal, that they didn't get anything, that special advantages are things that have only been given to other people, right? And that they li have lived in a meritocracy in which they and their forebears got by all on their own merits, right? I used to do this when I, uh, I don't teach the late 20th century anymore, but I used to teach a course that was from 1920 up to the present. So I would cover affirmative action. And when I did, I would ask my students at Princeton, when were the first racial and gender preferences in Princeton admissions put in? And I would ask them. The answer is 1746, because for the first 200 years of Princeton's existence, you had to be a white man to be admitted, right? But again, we don't think of that as a preference, as a privilege, as anything like that. We think of that as that just the way it was. It was normal, right? And so investigating the, the structural racism and inequalities that keep a lot of people out make people like me a straight white Christian Southern man who checks every box of privilege and preference in this culture, right? It causes people like me to panic, right? And I think that's the real sticking point here. It, we, again, and we saw this in the civil rights era, right? Whites in the North had no problem pointing at the racism in the South and saying that Jim Crow stuff is bad. They got to get rid of that. As soon as the civil rights movement went north and said, actually, there's a lot of structural racism in your housing, in your education, in your economic system, Martin Luther King started talking about capitalism itself was suspect, then they freaked out, right? Because it wasn't something that they were pointing at at arm's length, it was something that pointed back to, to them, right? And that's the problem, I think. Uh, just a quick follow-up to that. Uh, as an educator, and you mentioned that anecdote about the three guys who stormed out just unable to hear about the idea that they, their families in the past have been preferentially treated. As an educator, how do you go about, or how do you think the best way to go about kind of breaking down that um, mental blockage is? As an historian, I always go to the record, right? Um, and I try not to preach to people. Uh, uh, and I try to give them the primary evidence themselves to look at, right? So you can look at things like the, the Kerner Commission report after the, uh, the urban uprisings of the 60s. So talk about, look, they're laying out all the details here about the structural inequalities. I dive into, uh, when I teach the GI Bill, I do this. I, I point out that, you know, uh, this thing was promised to everybody and it, it was a huge economic boom. It's, it's probably the, the last gasp of the New Deal big government spending. Uh, and it does a lot of good for the country, but it's narrowly filtered in to certain people, right? Uh, and so I talk about the details of housing or, um, or college enrollment or things like that, you know? Um, I, I tell them that if you were an African-American veteran uh, in the South and you wanted to go to medical school, there was one place in the South you could go. It was in Nashville, Meharry Medical College. That was it. And Meharry had a class of maybe 40, Okay, so you're all in theory able to go get a medical education with this GI Bill money, but can you get one of those 40 spots? Not everyone can, right? Uh, and the same way with, you know, a uh, law school, you're going to go to Howard in DC, right? They've got a class of maybe 100. Can you get a spot, right? And so to lay out to people in, in terms, I think they understand the way in which these things on the surface seem to be race neutral, but are actually 
filtered in and what that was like, right? So history is essentially an act of empathy, right? Not sympathy, not that I see what you're going through and I, I agree with you, but empathy. I, I see how you see things through your eyes. So to try to get students to see things through other people's eyes and the primary evidence is always the best way to do that. All right, so my question has to do with um, history textbooks for high school students. So a lot of history textbooks have, are very selective on the African-American history they teach and it's very repetitive. Do you think it would be very or more beneficial for uh, students to learn about African-American history and culture from African-American history books and sources? So that way we get real and more information. I do, I do. There's a, there's a tendency in, in history textbooks, it's better now, but when I was growing up, uh, there was a there was a, a humor columnist, kind of hit or miss, but he had a, his name was Dave Barry, and he had a, a Dave Barry's Guide to American History, and he made a running joke that every chapter ended with one line: "Women and racial minorities also made contributions to this period," and it was just a boilerplate line, right? And it was meant to mock the way in which a lot of textbooks would have the real history, and then they'd shoehorn a paragraph at the end about what African Americans or Latinos or women had done in addition to this real history, right? And that's just not the way to do it. Um, and African-American studies is, uh, and we, I live in a place that where I've seen, we had a program in African-American studies, became a center in African-American studies, it's now a full-blown department with some of the top scholars uh, in, in the country. I've got some brilliant people uh, who are just down the hall from me uh, or across campus from me. And, uh, and that's fantastic. They're bringing a lot to the table. I wouldn't wanna see just that though. I think African-American studies brings a lot but I teach 20th century US history. And you cannot understand that without understanding the way in which this country reckoned uh, painfully at times with the rights of African-Americans, right? I mean, that's the through line in 20th century US history, not just the civil rights struggle, the fight over segregation at home, anything you look at, this is why I was drawn to the 1619 project. Anything you look at has a racial component to it in this country. It's just, it's unescapable, right? The big political history story of the 20th century is the evolution of the Democratic Party from the party of segregation and white supremacy to being the party of civil rights, right? The social story is one of a rights revolution that comes into being largely through the actions of a post-war civil rights struggle. The economic story is one of which structural racism kept a lot of people behind and the fight for inclusion and advancement, right? So any of these issues, are at some level or another, either very much so at the, at the forefront, or if you scratch the surface kind of deeply behind the scenes, are wrapped up with histories of race. So people who are working in places like a Department of African American Studies or a solely African American history are doing vital work, but I don't want that siloed off from American history, right? I don't want that to be a separate thing because it can't be. You cannot understand where America is today if you don't reckon directly with the struggles of African-Americans in this country in the, in the 20th century, you just can't. Going off of Ashton's question about history textbooks and what we're taught in the classroom, you know, you were at MBA during the late 1980s and early 1990s. Can you tell us about your experience in US history at MBA and general conversations and attitudes towards race at this school? Yeah, um, I was at MBA in an era where we were not fortunate enough to have someone as uh, educated and talented as Dr. Boyd teaching U.S. history. I'll just be blunt about it. Uh, most of my history courses when I was here were taught by, um, by football coaches and wrestling coaches who some were decent, uh, but the guy who taught me U.S. history, uh, I think, had, a, had an MBA, a master's of business administration from Auburn and literally sat on the desk and read the textbook to us. That was it, right? So I didn't get much of a history education. In fact, I think I almost went into history in spite of that. I was so drawn to the stuff in the textbook. I thought, if I could just get a real teacher, if I could go to a college that had real classes, this stuff would be fascinating. Like if even you just reading this textbook can make it come alive for me, imagine what someone who cared could do. Now I had a couple of good people. Uh, um, Mr. Herring did a world history class, uh, who, uh, which was kind of made things come alive. I remember text from that. Uh, it was my art history teacher, Jim Walmack, who's the one who really got me into history, kind of through an, through an adjacent field. I love Jim Walmack. And he had a passion for that, uh, that material and really made it come alive. And, and that's where I could see myself getting involved in teaching. I saw in, in Mr. Walmack 
uh, a real model there. As far as race, um, MBA was not technically segregated, but as tokenly integrated as humanly possible. I had, I think, one Black classmate, one South Asian classmate, one Asian American classmate. And that was it out of a class of probably 60, 70, right? So not all white, but vastly majority white, right? And that was a, a very weird thing to be, um, uh, even in Nashville in the 80s, it was, it was odd. Uh, and and, and it, it, I think it, it triggered in me a, an awareness that, again, this, this place never really felt, and I, I, it's changed. Again, I came back to give an MLK Day uh, talk a, a decade ago, and I was struck by how much it had just changed since then. I can't imagine now, but back then, uh, very white, very not entirely politically conservative, but very socially conservative, right? And I think the approach to racial issues and issues of justice was was part of that, right? Did I answer all your questions? You threw you threw a bunch at me there. If I if I left thing on the table, let me know. No, you got it. Thank you. Uh, I have kind of a different question that's more macro in scale. Yeah. Um, I guess one of the greatest, one of the bigger memes in the political sense of the last couple of months has been this critical race theory thing yeah. um, that the entire political right seems to be seeing this as their new boogeyman, um, their new culture war item. Um, I guess my question is, when people criticize critical race theory, do you consider critical race theory as an academic approach to be something different from the boogeyman they cast it as? And if so, do you think ideas of critical race theory are valuable lenses for looking at history? Yeah, yeah. I, I think what they've described is very different than what critical race theory is. Um, at, at all levels, this panic is really overblown. Um, uh, the right has discovered something which came into being around when I was born um, and has filtered through academia for decades now. Um, uh, and, and the sudden realization that this is out there uh, has been kind of surprising. It's, yeah, I don't know, you know, what are they gonna discover next? Social history or, or you know. Um, so that's been odd. The way it's been presented, of course, has you know uh, the the nuances, the the, the details have been um, have been shorn off. I just saw a poll uh, this morning uh, that a Republican firm uh, uh, commissioned, uh, in which I think critical race theory was basically described as um, teaching students that race is the most important thing in their lives. It's the thing that defines them. Every single outcome is determined by race. No, that's not. CRT at all, right? And I think the problem here is that this assault, and we're seeing this in the legislation being applied and proposed at the state level, Tennessee uh, including uh, other states, where the language here is such that I'm not a critical race theorist. I don't, I don't approach that, but things I write about and things I teach about would be outlawed under this, that you're considering the role of race in systems, in government, you're considering um, uh, uh, the, the impact of systemic racism on, on people, um, unconscious bias, things like that, that are beyond part of critical race theory, but lots of people have written about this for a long time who aren't critical race theorists. And so there's this movement to squash something that is becoming much broader and vaguer than it ever should be. And it's gonna, I think, wrap up a lot of people. I mean, are you not allowed to talk about segregation? Are you not allowed to talk about the roots of the Civil War? I mean, what's off the table now, right? Um, and what's, and this is the, the trouble is that we've got people making policy who I think got their history in an earlier era. And again, like I talked about white people thinking of themselves as normal, they thought that that history is normal, right? They saw the textbooks they got in the 50s and 60s when they were coming of age were just telling it like it was, like there hadn't been an effort to rewrite history in a way. All history is revisionist, right? We're constantly revising, we're constantly updating. That term gets thrown around as, as if it's suspect. All history is revisionist. When we get new sources, when we get new approaches, when we ask new questions, we revise, right? We're constantly doing that. It's the reason why people like me are still employed, right? We, if all the history had been done, we could walk away and we could just press play on a, on a video and y'all could watch it, right? There would be no need to do new history. <laughs> um, but that's what we do, right? But there's a weird 
belief on the part of a lot of people that the, the history they got in the 50s was, again, perfect, that it hadn't been shaped with certain racist assumptions in mind, that it hadn't erased a lot of African-American history, that it hadn't erased a lot of movements for social justice in the South, right? That there's a lot of history that got uh, erased out of there, right? You know, you weren't in the 50s reading about communist labor organizers in 1930s Alabama, right? You weren't reading about the purges that Democrats and Republicans made in their party to drive people out. You weren't reading about, you know, uh, 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 kind of the economic pressure brought on, on black workers. That was all left out. It happened, but that history had been whitewashed, right? And so people came up reading a certain history and then they get their kids' books a few decades later, which have been revised again, like all history books are. And they say, wait a second, this changed. I mean, it's like, I, I'm, a, I'm a parent of two kids. It's like when they, they throw out a different approach to math and you think, well, that's not how I learned math. Why do you have to learn math this way? There's a real, I think, revolt on parents on that part. But with history, it feels personal because the history isn't just the history of the nation. It's the history of your family, of your, your world, of your of yourself. Thank you. Going off of that, as someone who actively is working to dismantle systematic racism, you must come across a lot of resistance. Oh, yeah. One of the most common arguments against systematic racism is that all issues one might attribute to systematic racism should be solely attributed to the culture of the Black community. How have you addressed this response in your work or in your classroom? Yeah, I've, I've, there's lots of resistance. And again, it's it's from those reasons I stated earlier that uh, a lot of people just don't want to confront this because it, it makes them ask questions about, about themselves. So all I can do is move beyond is to make it less about personal feelings. And instead to, again, this is why I think it's important to look at systemic and, and system-wide racism is it takes the onus off individuals, right? It's possible to know that you, your family may have benefited from this. It's not saying you're to blame for it, but you've benefited from it. And to show people how these things worked, what the details were, how it unfolded, how it left certain people out, how it let certain people in, the myths we told ourselves at the time about this, um, uh, and to really just kind of, again, bring the evidence to them uh, and, and show them up front uh, how this really operated. Uh, and therefore, it's not that I'm not lecturing someone about something they've got unfairly. I'm letting them, in some ways, figure it out for themselves. Okay. And a follow-up question behind that. Yeah. I recently watched this um, video of a professor going and explaining what racism actually means and how it's more of a um, systematic thing more than like just something that we colloquially use. And his argument was that white people cannot experience racism due to it being a systematic and structural thing. How do you feel about that argument? I think white people could still experience racism. I, I think it's different than that. I think the way in which white people experience racism is the way in which a lot of white people understand it, right? That someone is making a blanket statement about all blanks are this, or, or using a racial slur or being very direct about it. And so that kind of racism, I think, is, is easy for, uh, for whites to see to themselves because that's the only racism they see. If they don't see someone using the N-word, they don't think they're racist, right? Uh, and so there's a level of racism that goes beneath that. I think the way to talk about this is to, again, just to let people think about, it's not, it's not, I almost said black and white. It's not completely one or the other, right? It's not 100% or 0%. There are gradations in between. The best explanation I've seen of white privilege uh, came from a sci-fi writer named John Scalzi. And he had a blog post about this uh, in which he explained that, um, think of it in terms of video game settings. Straight white male is the easiest setting there is, right? And if you play a game on the easiest setting, you're still playing the game and you still get points for doing this and that and meeting, reading that point, right? But if you want to play it at the hardest setting, it's not straight white male, it's, uh, it's, it's black female lesbian, right? And that's, you've got all the challenges in front of you, right? And that's the hardest way to play the game. And so it's not that people are creating you know, a new author, just you've got a little leg up if you're starting from that position with all those privilege points, right? And you're still, you're still doing things, you're still making accomplishments, you're still fine, just you don't run into as many obstacles as someone else playing on the game on the hardest setting might do. 
right? And so that's a way I think to think about it. Again, it's not that you had everything handed to you or you had nothing handed to you, but there are certain small leg ups, legs up you had, uh, what's the plural of that? Legs up you had. Uh, and that has, has kind of accreted uh, a level of, of advantage that other people simply don't have. Kind of taking a step in a different direction, referencing your 1619 article, do you talk about red line practices, interstates, and other factors that have left the Black community impoverished? Do you think that socioeconomic disparities or racial biases are more of a problem or cannot talk about one without the other? Yeah, well, if you ask an historian anything, ask Dr. Boyd these kind of questions, we'll always say it's a little of both, right? And it seems like a cop out, but it's it's just it's an awareness of the way in which these things are tied up together, right? So there are certainly there are uh, African Americans of of wealth and means who have certainly escaped these problems. There are poor white people who are dealing with some of the same issues, right? And so there's there's an overlap uh, in these issues that you always have to consider. Uh, I do think it's been it's been compounded, uh, and this is where the I think the investigation of, of structural racism really get to some of the root causes of the issue is that there was, as uh, as Ashton said, there has been an emphasis on the parts of some people to pathologize, that everything that happens here is the fault of the Black community, right? The, this is kind of the Moynihan report on the Negro family in the 60s. Uh, the, there, there are certain problems in African-American family structure uh, that have been endemic, and that's where all the problems come from. It, it's kind of a, a blaming the victim approach. But again, if you look at the economic discrimination behind that, you see the pressures put on the black family here, right? Again, a lack of intergenerational wealth being handed down, which gives a leg up uh, to other people, which is not there. Uh, discrimination in hiring, discrimination in education, employment, which leads to a lot of avenues being closed down. So it's harder to make a living, to own a house, to find a place to live. Uh, and even if you do find a place to live, it's something I, I showed in my book, White Flight. You've got, you know, middle class and upper class uh, black families buying homes from working class white people and paying two or three times as much for the house. So yeah, they finally get that house. It's a second kind of generation house handed down to them. And they've paid through the nose for it. And they've got to pay more for insurance. They've got to pay more for this and that. They finally got that American dream, but they had to pay three times as much for it, right? Well, that's money you now don't have for the kid's college fund or for vacations or for a newer this or that, right? That's money you've sunk uh, that other people didn't have to sink to get the exact same thing. In fact, to get something that was, they got new when you got 10, 15 years down the line, right? And so that uh, kind of weighs in. So you can't understand the, the economic status without understanding the way in which race closed off certain doors. And a quick follow-up to that question, there's an MBA alum working on a guaranteeing income experiment in North Nashville zip code 37208, which is 70% black when Nashville is 70% white and has a poverty rate double Nashville's average. There's been similar projects done across the country to try to address racial economic disparities. What is your view on this guaranteeing income pilot and similar ones across the country? Yeah. Um... Again, as an historian, my training is in hindsight, right? So it, it's difficult for me to uh, to make predictions about policies moving forward. So this is probably a question for uh, for an economist. Um, uh, I will say uh, any move for something like a universal basic, basic income, a UBI, uh, is going to be good in a broader sense that I think it's going to provide economic uplift. It's going to provide a certain sense of, uh, of, of stimulus for these individuals who are, who are left out. Um, and UBI is not a radical idea. Um, Richard Nixon, with the advice of Milton Friedman, the great libertarian economist, embraced uh, a program called the, the Family Assistance uh, Program in the 70s, which is basically going to be a, a negative income tax. If your income fell below a certain level, Richard Nixon wanted to give people basic income to boost them up, right? So if Nixon can do it, we can consider it today. The Shortcoming here is, I think, on the economic side, I think it makes perfect sense. The question is then, where do you draw the line, right? And I think that's where people are going to run into trouble, right? And so is this 
you know, uh, ADOS is this African descendants of slaves that you're talking about, or do you have to, would it have to be families that had been here in the 60s and been discriminated against who, who get it, right? There are all kinds of troublesome questions. This is why the easiest answer is to make it a universal basic income to everyone, uh, and then you don't have to decide who's in, who's out. Uh, but that's a question for the policymakers. I, I certainly applaud the effort. I think it'll it'll do real good in that community. Um, I'm not sure how replicable that is uh, across uh, the entire country, unless it's done with everyone, right? It's much easier to identify the problems in the past than to provide the corrections for the future. So I, I, I try to focus on uh, the easier part. Uh, so I had a kind of a more niche question regarding the economic um, kind of social issues that Iman talked about and Ash talked about a little bit. Uh, Cornell West spoke to MBA about two years ago and mm -hmm. referenced one of the ideas in his book, Race Matters, um, that kind of both sides miss something about structural racism. The left uh, thinks it's all economic and misses that there's I think it's like nihilism in the black community about the potential for racial emancipation. And the conservatives think it's all social, all about the nuclear family and miss issues of structural deprivation. Uh, in responding to that thesis, would you think is that do you think that's on base or do you, do you think that um there are any other fact confounding factors or one's more important than the other uh, yeah I, I think both of those factors are true uh mm -hmm. i would come down on the side that i think the the economic uh impact of the structural racism is, is i think more important than uh, i think and they're related again the nihilism in the black community that cornell would identify is something that came out of those economic um, strictures, right? Which, which, which you have that nihilism if you don't have easy access to college or housing or, or the kind of things that make other people believe, well, there's a reason for optimism. There's a reason for hope, right? You shut down those avenues for escape, I, I would be nihilistic too. Um, and so I think they're related. I think it's important, but that is in some ways tied back in uh, uh, to the economic issues. Okay, an argument that's coming back up nowadays is the argument about reparations for African American and descendants of African American slaves. What do you feel on that standpoint? Again, this is it's it's something on the surface. I think we we certainly uh, owe African Americans. The, the question is programmatically, how does that get applied? Right? Do you have to, as an African American, provide proof that your family traces back to those who were held in bondage in pre-1865 America, right? What if it's, you were in a territory? What if you your family immigrated? Um, uh, what if you were a West, a West Indian, right? A uh, Jamaican who came here in, uh, in the 19 teens and 1920s, certainly discriminated against, not in the era of slavery, right? I mean, how do they filter in? So I think that's where those programs, I think they seem great in the abstract. I think when we, whenever we try to put them in the place, uh, they're, they're a little more difficult uh, uh, in person. Uh, I have no problem with the, the, the justice uh, instinct behind them, uh, but just whenever they're rolled out, uh, they're a little tricky. And then it leads to the invariable political blowback, not that that should kill it, but, but the more these things are, are proposed, the more there's resistance, right? And we've seen this in recent years with things that were totally not reparations, right? When Barack Obama, you guys are too young, when, when Obama... Um, proposed uh, the Affordable Care Act uh, and uh, the stimulus package after the Wall Street meltdown, things that were applied uh, uh, to the, uh, the country writ large. Conservative commentators like Rush Limbaugh denounced it as reparations for African Americans, right? And so things that weren't that way, were, there was pushback in that framing. If there's actual reparations, uh, the amount of political howling on the right will be, uh, will be intense. Again, not a reason not to do it, like one of the things that I think has really impressed me about the, the Biden administration is their willingness to just ignore some of the loud complaints on the right um, and just kind of go it alone. That's been impressive. Uh, but I think there will be, it will be politically tricky. It will be uh, pro uh, programmatically difficult to, to get these things uh, through. Um, and not a reason not to do it. But again, from my perspective, as someone who has been involved uh, in implementing these things, I'm kind of vaguely aware that it, it's a little bit tricky to actually pull off. I was going to ask as a follow up, do you think that there could be a new form of reparations created to make up at least for like generational curses that African Americans have had, like, as you're saying, redlining, not being able yeah. to get proof for loans, 
um, not being able to own land, that types of thing, those types of things. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there are and there are lots of programs like that in the under the guise of not reparations, but affirmative action, right? Um, which which doesn't just target African Americans, lots of different groups, women, white women, actually the greatest beneficiary of affirmative action. Uh, but those kind of programs will be a way to to alleviate and overcome. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I don't have any policy predictions going forward. I'm sorry. You know, you referenced a lot how we're trying to always um, revisit history and also revise it. And that's where we're trying to identify history and how it's been written, how it's been biased and how people have been writing it. So in talking about how we honor history today and those revisions, what is your view on Confederate monuments and how they honor history? What do you have to say about that? And even you might be aware that NBA recently removed our Confederate statue of Sam Davis. So yeah. can you hear what that's your thoughts on that? Well, again, yeah, to, speaking of uh, when I was at MBA in history, we used to, there was a Sam Davis um, um, uh, essay contest we'd have to write about Sam Davis. I don't know if you all still have to do that, but yeah, so things have changed. Um, those monuments, again, uh, are presented as, when people talk about tearing down the monuments, the argument always is, A, that's erasing history. No, it's not. I, I don't, there are no monuments in here. I have books. I have documents. That's how I teach history. I don't teach, I don't trot out a statue and teach history that way, right? That's not how we do it. So that's an idiotic argument. But also there's a refusal to realize that those statues themselves were an effort at rewriting history, right? They were a product. They weren't erected after the Civil War. They were erected largely in the 19 teens and 1920s when Jim Crow was sweeping across the country, when the Klan was on the march, when the uh, United Daughters of the Confederacy was promoting these things and funding them in order to teach their contemporaries a particular racial message, right? I went to school at, at University of North Carolina. We had a statue there called Silent Sam. You can go back and look at the dedication of Silent Sam. And the man who dedicates it, a white supremacist named Julian Carr, says quite explicitly that he wants this statue to be there so that the Negroes in town in 19, whatever it was, 12, understand their place in society. That's what that statue was. It wasn't about celebrating some Confederate past, some battle, some accomplishment. It was to pressure and to, um, uh, to, to cause fear in the Black community. That's what they wanted to do, right? And so when people were debating Silent Sam and UNC, I, on Twitter, I posted the, the, the speech this guy gave. And I said, if you're going to defend this, read this speech out loud. Read this speech to a crowd at UNC and see how well it goes over today, right? Uh, and no one's willing to do that. Um, and there is, yes, I, the argument of it, it's a slippery slope. I don't buy that at all. These monuments to Confederate soldiers and generals are monuments to what they did with the Confederacy, right? They're just monuments to the fact that they committed a bloody war of treason in defense of white supremacy. That's what they did. It's not the same as a statue to Washington, and you guys may disagree. I don't think it's the same as a statue to Washington or Jefferson. We don't celebrate Washington because he was a slave owner, right? Washington is celebrated for things he did besides that. We acknowledge the dark spot on his record. Same with Jefferson, same with all these people, right? We acknowledge that. You put a statue up for Nathan Bedford Forrest in, in Nashville, you're celebrating a guy who, either if you're not celebrating the fact that he created the Ku Klux Klan or was part of that group, you're celebrating the fact that he, again, was a military leader and a rebellion fought for white supremacy. Who wants to defend that? I, I know there's an answer, but I mean, I, I find it baffling. I've said this time and time again, I'm, I'm a Southerner. There, there's a lot of great stuff to celebrate in the South, right? The Confederacy is not one of them, right? There is so much great about the region, the people, the culture, the history, the food, the music. The Confederacy is not even on my top 10,000 list. Yes, again, uh, I'm sorry, you, you, one last thing. You go to Nazi Germany, they don't have statues of, of, of you know, Rommel. Rommel was a great military leader. We don't have statues to Rommel across Europe or North Africa celebrating his military conquest. He fought for the Nazis. Good riddance, right? Sorry, Sam. Uh, 
No worries. Um, I guess the last question is, it's pretty easy to agree that we shouldn't in any way honor the Confederates, but, and it's uh, less controversial to say, I guess, that people like Washington and Jefferson can be celebrated for their virtues and condemned for their faults and seen as complicated men and complicated, uh, and complicating what they did. For, there are, I guess there are thousands of places across the country, institutions, including MBA, that are named after, like Montgomery Bell owned yeah. slave. Um, and various other institutions, schools, et cetera. I know Princeton had the issue with Woodrow Wilson mm -hmm. several years back and the Woodrow Wilson School of Foreign Policy. Um, I guess that's kind of a middle, a middle question yeah. between the two is that these people were demonstrably racist, um, but they weren't fighting tre treasonously for the Confederacy. Right. So how do you approach those kinds of situations as kind of a different thing than the Confederate monuments? Yeah, again, it's, it's, it's never 100% or 0%. Or We're always on some kind of spectrum along the way here. And the question is, where do we as a society uh, draw the line, right? And I think at some point, there's a danger in going, I think, too far, right? Martin Luther King had homophobic comments and and could could say things behind the scenes that were uh, 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 bad on gender, right? Uh, and and on those things has those black marks. Um, that doesn't mean we're going to cancel MLK, right? Sorry, I use the term cancel. God, I hate that term. Um, uh, but so, so it doesn't mean that that we sh people should come for that, right? Um, and so there's there's a there's a spectrum here, right? And I think it's got to be at what level are we celebrating these people for the good they did and, and acknowledging the bad they did, right? So, so my, my approach to the Woodrow Wilson thing here was Wilson did a lot wrong, but rather than a racist name, we should contextualize that, right? So say you have the Woodrow Wilson school and then acknowledge Wilson segregated DC. Wilson did this and that. Wilson did a lot of things wrong in addition to his ideals because it gives us the fully complex view of history, right? It lets us reckon with the good and the bad. In fact, to understand that the good only comes about in relation with the bad and vice versa, right? And to think about those as, as, a, as a kind of um, uh, a rich mixture. So I would be in favor of that kind of more nuanced take. Uh, uh, take, you know, take Jim Eastland's name and Theodore Bilbo and, uh, and, and, uh, and Forrest and Robert E. Lee off everything. I'm all for that. In the middle, uh, maybe a little more contextualization because at some point, um, everyone is, is, is going to be flawed, right? All right. Well, uh, thank you all uh, for, for being part of this. And I hope it's clear from this conversation why whenever we do send people to Princeton, we try and encourage them to take uh, Professor Cruz's class. And This is a great conversation. I really appreciate talking with you three and, and, and Dr. Boyd, too. Um, uh, uh, keep up the good work there. Uh, it's nice to know you guys are there at MBA doing this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.